Good evening. Welcome. It is wonderful to have everyone here tonight. I'm Mary Ann Lewis. I am Professor of Management and Dean here at the Cass Business School. I am truly delighted to, for us to be hosting again this forum for the annual Contrarian Prize. This year the event is particularly extraordinary, in part due, its, due to its very timely focus, as well as this remarkable panel. And also I will note it because it is part of the 50th anniversary celebrations here at CAS, which is a year-long excuse to celebrate and have tremendous events like tonight. So tonight does epitomize who we are here at CAS. We enable the extraordinary, we say, through three interwoven elements, knowledge, education, and community. And it's at this intersection that CAS is both exceptionally distinctive and vibrant. So regarding knowledge, it is critical to us that we stay on the cutting edge through the research of our faculty and learning from renowned experts like our panelists tonight. Regarding education, we teach over 4,000 students across undergraduate, MSc, MBA, and executive education, and our ranked courses are all recognized in the top 40 in the world, not to brag. But our third element, the CAS community fuels our innovative and international experience. Our alumni span over 160 countries now, about 38,000 strong. And today, it's a pleasure to host all of you, our many students, faculty, friends, and partners, both community and corporate. Those of you who share clearly tonight our passion for learning in provocative and insightful forums like it this. So as I noted, tonight's topic is particularly timely. It's also very fitting of CAS. We are fervent believers here in the power of discourse, debate, and even tensions to fuel learning. So before I hand over the podium to our convener, who will provide further welcome and help set the stage, I wish to stress my thanks to him, Ali Mirage. He serves, Ali serves on our CAS strategy and development board, and personally, I am extremely grateful for his energy and contrarian spirit. So let's warmly welcome and thank Ali for his leadership of tonight's learning opportunity. Thank you. Ali. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is always great to be here at CAS, and it is uh, particularly fitting to be hosting this special contrarian prize debate in the 50th anniversary year of the school. We have convened three lectures here in previous years, which have been delivered by the past winners of the contrarian prize. And tonight is going to be something special and different as well. Uh, I must thank uh, CAS Business School and Marianne in particular for their hospitality and generosity in hosting us here and also to Mariam and the events team and Kyla and Sophie for their hard work in putting this all together. Now Claire is going to uh, introduce the panel uh, in a moment but I'd like to express my gratitude to them all uh, and we're looking forward to what will be a stimulating and wide-ranging discussion and a special thanks to uh, Isabella Kaminska from the FT who stepped in at the very last moment. Uh, to plug a gap. Please feel free to... Uh... <laughs> well, I do work in infrastructure finance, so anyway. Um, uh, please uh, feel free to tweet referencing at Contrarian Prize uh, and using the hashtag CPRIZE. We are living through an extraordinarily difficult and turbulent period with change on the horizon. We have experienced two political earthquakes in both the UK and the US, and the reverberations will last for years. Where do we go from here? It's a difficult question and one that we need to ponder. Many in the political and media classes are trying to understand why this happened. Let me share some of my thoughts as to how we got here. A couple of months ago, I sat under a canopy in the heat of the Iranian desert and looked out onto the tomb of Cyrus the Great. As I cast my eyes on the serene scene with not a sound to be heard, I reflected. Here was the resting place of a man 
who as head of the Achaemenid dynasty over two and a half thousand years ago, founded the largest empire the world had seen. In doing so, he developed a new form of statecraft, showing respect for human rights, customs, and the religion of those in the lands that he conquered, even though they were different to his own. It is said that he enshrined the first Bill of Rights in the Cyrus Cylinder, which is now housed in the British Museum. I wanted to post a, a message on Facebook or Twitter, but both are banned in Iran, so I had to wait until I got back to London to do so. Here, I am in theory able to post freely about my views on social media, but the reality is somewhat different. The inalienable right of free speech that we pride ourselves on is under threat. A fundamental part of that freedom is the ability to express a view that is contrarian to the mainstream, but it is being curtailed. We are, in my view, regressing from the open-mindedness of Cyrus the Great. The Economist newspaper ran this cover in June. Free speech under attack. On university campuses on both sides of the Atlantic, institutions that were once the bedrock of open debate, radical ideas, and dissent have been, become bastions of conformity. Debate is being censored by hypersensitive students on the grounds that what a certain person says <clears throat> is deemed offensive. But offense is a subjective term. These students are aggressive in shutting down the opinions of those they disagree with and have been referred to by Claire Fox in her book as Generation Snowflake. Now, Claire will be signing copies of her book afterwards, and I commend it to you. <laughs> <laughs> the latest example of this tendency was shown by students at Cardiff University who tried to who took offense at the comments by Jermaine Greer, a feminist writer, who made some comments about her views on post-operative transgender individuals. Now, Peter Tatchell, hugely respected human rights campaigner, who I'm delighted to see is here with us this evening. When Peter said you should debate with her rather than silence her, he was branded as transphobic by the LGBT officer of the National Union of Students. Now, just think about that for a second. Here is a man who has spent the last 50 years fearlessly campaigning for human rights, and he's labeled as transphobic. Where has this hypersensitivity come from? Who decides what is allowable in discussion and what is off limits? Is it, is it right that contrarian views are curtailed just because they differ from mainstream opinion. Can you imagine what Emmeline Pankhurst and the suffragettes, if they had shied away for campaigning for women to have the right to vote on the grounds that some people found their views offensive? So why is it so vital to be able to express one's view and to go against the grain? Well, just as the progressive house music played at the London nightclub <coughs> Fabric provided an antidote to the uh, chart toppers played in certain salubrious salons in the West End. Similarly, people who express their opinions stand up for what they believe provide a contrarian view to mainstream thinking. That is important for three reasons. The first is the avoidance of groupthink. The first organization to recognize this was the Catholic Church in 1708 that enshrined the concept of advocatus diaboli, or devil's advocate, whose job it was to find out, point out, potential character flaws in candidates for canonization. Second, the contrarian challenges the accepted orthodoxy. This was highlighted in a national theater play, Dara, about the battle between Aurangzeb, the Mughal emperor, and his brother Dara Shikur, 
to take over the, the crown from their father, Shah Jahan. Now, Aurangzeb's literalist and exclusivist interpretation of Islam contrasted with his brother's <coughs> liberal and pluralistic one. Ed, how times have changed. The price that Dara paid for standing up for his principles and showing tolerance to those with different views to his own was to be charged with apostasy and to have his severed head sent to his parents in a gift box. And third, the contrarian changes the terms of the debate. A fine example is Václav Havel, the Czech dissident, who stood against the regime and was imprisoned many, many times for doing so, and went on to play a major role in the Velvet Revolution in 1989 that saw the collapse of communism, and he went on to lead his country. Progress is made when people are prepared to confront conventional wisdom. But in the cyber world, we are using technology to filter out the opinions of those who we disagree with, enabling us to procure an a la carte menu to suit our tastes. The result is that many of us simply operate <coughs> in an echo chamber. In such an environment, it is difficult to be contrarian. The inability to express one's opinion openly, for example, on issues such as immigration, has, in my view, led people to rail against the cozy neoliberal consensus. In the space of five months, first Brexit, then the election of Donald Trump as US president, has seen the established order raised to the ground. We could have called this debate conformity in an age of contrarianism. <laughs> In today's world, the forgotten people are the biggest contrarians. Now, the contrarian prize seeks to recognize individuals in British public life that demonstrate independence of thought, courage and conviction in their actions, make a sacrifice, and introduce new ideas into the public realm or have an impact on the public debate. Nominations come from the public via the website contrarianprize.com. Nominations for the 2017 prize are now open. They close at the end of the year. So please visit the website, read about the previous winners, nominate someone in public life who you believe is worthy of the accolade, and spread the word. Independence of thought, standing up for what you believe, and challenging the status quo has never been more important. In the words of Thomas Jefferson, timid men prefer the calm of despotism to the tempestuous sea of liberty. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ali. A uh, really great scene setter there. So yes, I'm Claire Fox. I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas. And I have to confess that over the years, I've been called a contrarian. And I've always found it to be an insult, because I've always found it irritating that people might think that if somebody says black, I say white, and people who behave like that kind of get on my nerves. But when Ali asked me to be a judge for the prize, he made such a good case, as we've just heard, that I was convinced, and I realised that how important it was, and that, in fact, the spirit of this prize was very much something that I'm passionate about, which is the need to sometimes be the awkward squad, and certainly always to defend the awkward squad. And I think it does require some bravery at the moment to go against the grain, because there are huge pressures to conform, to watch what you say. We often feel like we're walking on eggshells. There's a prescriptive set of views that are allowed, and there's a whole range of things, increasing the numbers of issues that are deemed to be taboo topics that we're not allowed to discuss. And that does not seem to me to be particularly healthy for any kind of a democratic society. We also are familiar with this whole idea of echo chambers now, silos, only talking to people who are likely to agree with you. Um, safe spaces is the form it takes on university campuses. But the whole kind of preaching to the choir is something which many people do, and it does create a kind of cloying conformism that we want to shake up. So Ali has gathered a panel to just give us their opening thoughts on that. It's not, you see, there would be a danger here that even though we're talking about this, that we're all going to agree. 
I'm not suggesting that I artificially create a fight among the panel. That's not really my point. But I think that there are questions to be asked, though, because some people would say that the ultimate act of contrarianism was voting in Donald Trump. So there can be, um, in many ways, uh, some peculiar consequences. Or maybe that's a good consequence. Or was he, the, because they, people were kind of so fed up with conformism, they voted for him. But we've at least got to ask the question, is it all positive to keep uh, kicking against the pricks, as it were? Do, does it being a contrarian mean that we have to defend Eric Bristow, the darts player, uh, from mad tweets about, uh, or maybe not mad if you're, you know, you've... <laughs> all right. Um, anyway. Uh, 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 Risto for his uh, cer certainly not sensitive tweets about um, <laughs> sexual abuse and, and football uh, clubs. But, you know, on the other hand, freedom of speech. He just said something on Twitter. Should he get sacked, pilloried, and all the rest of it? How do we feel about that? Um, and how do we feel about those uh, many young people I know who, as a kind of counter to the conformist times, can be gratuitously offensive? some of the examples of the alt-right that is now much talked about, or those who say things like feminism is cancer. Is that kind of great uh, 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 maverick uh, contrarian behaviour that we want to celebrate tonight? So at least there's a few question marks. It's not just a straightforward let's all agree moment. So I'm now going to introduce the panel in the order in which they'll speak, but just on, a little bit on format. They've all been uh, fairly strictly told by Ali that it's five minutes each, which I'll keep them to, um, just to give us their kind of opening thoughts. I'm then going to go straight out to the uh, audience, not for a straightforward Q&A, but going to take clumps of thoughts from you, either questions, but also contributions, get you to say something, then come back to the panel and keep it a bit fast moving. It's basically a public conversation on this very I important issue and where, uh, what we feel about it. So uh, let's uh, meet our panel in the order they'll speak. So, uh, oh yes, sitting next to me. Right, <laughs> so first of all, we're going to hear from uh, Peter Satchel. Uh, we've already heard uh, uh, Ali talk about him as the uh, human rights campaigner of world renown uh, and, and uh, director of the Peter Satchel Foundation, uh, inspired by Gandhi, Sylvia Pankhurst and Martin Luther King, who I think in their day were indeed contrarians. But it is important to recognise not just that he's both been a victim of the no-platform position of the NUS, effectively no-platform, and called names for his views, but that I think in the terms of bravery, he does go against the grain. The fact that recently, uh, Peter, as a campaigner, associated so much with uh, achieving so much for LGBT uh, uh, equality, also defended the Christian bakers um, from the law when they refused to bake in the gay uh, cake uh, uh, incident is an indication of his real commitment uh, uh, to free speech and I know that he got a lot of stick for that as he often does when he speaks his mind. The next person we'll hear from is Ed Hussain who is Director of Strategy at the Tony Blair uh, Faith Foundation and author of the best-selling book The Islamist which um, I have to say one of my remains one of my uh, favourite books very influential in the way I understood uh, uh, the rise of extremism uh, Ed is the founder of the world's uh, first counter-extremism think tank, Quilliam, and the whole area around uh, uh, counter-extremism, extremism, extremism uh, radicalisation is fraught with the dangers of being accused by all sides of being a sellout, and it certainly requires uh, bravery if you have read his book to go as somebody uh, uh, who, who was influenced by Islamism to then make the, the stance that he's made, but then now to be told, uh, called an Uncle Tom and all the rest of it, would indicate the way things can go. And uh, obviously he works with the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, which requires a certain amount of bravery in and of itself. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just making the point that some people would say... The faith bit of the foundation bit. It's the, uh, the, the, the faith bit, the foundation bit, but yes, good joke. Right, Gisela Stewart. Gisela Stewart MP will be hearing from uh, next, who's the chair of Change Britain, elected uh, as a, a Labour MP, the first Labour MP uh, of Birmingham Edgebaston in 1997, uh, chair of Vote Leave, uh, the Brexit campaign group. And we'll all know that because she was all over the media during the uh, uh, EU referendum. But think about what that means to be uh, a Labour Party MP and to, uh, and to lead on, on, on arguing for uh, Brexit from the EU. 
Not because um, there was anything wrong with that. In fact, I have uh, every sympathy with what she argued during that time and continues to argue. But because it meant going against many of her colleagues, going against the whole of the establishment in many ways, but also just kind of daring to speak out. Um, and I think that in that sense, uh, she will know something of this topic of, of, of um, um, being a contrarian or being accused of being one and, and, um, and certainly uh, 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 fighting for her principles and her beliefs. Next, we've got Isabella uh, Kaminska, who is a Financial Times journalist who joined the FT Alphaville in October 2008 uh, and before that were, um, um, was worked as a producer at CNBC. And I think that the media in this is crucial. I think having a, a media and journalists who are prepared to ask questions, be the awkward squad, is incredibly important for us all. Um, and I, I, as we know, of late, the media have sometimes got things wrong by being led by their own prejudices rather than um, actually investigating. So it'll be so interesting to hear from you on that, Isabella. But also, I like the fact that her route to economics is slightly unusual and stems from her childhood fascination with ancient economics, specifically agrarian land reforms and early of the early Roman Republic and the coinage and price stability reforms of the late Roman uh, uh, emperors. I mean, what can you say? Mm. And I'm, this is an unusual young woman, uh, 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 whatever else. Anyway, um, but great to have somebody, uh, in a way, um, talking about journalism uh, uh, here. And then finally, we'll be hearing from Professor Sir Simon Wesley, who is president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, where he was elected in 2014. Uh, um, uh, he's just won, very importantly, the John Maddox Prize uh, by Nature magazine for standing up for science. He. Uh, set up the first NHS service for sufferers of chronic fatigue syndrome, which I know has got him um, into uh, a stick on all sides of that uh, particular uh, issue. He set up the King's Centre for Military Health Research and, acted as, and has acted as a civilian consultant advisor in psychiatry for the British Army, uh, visiting armed, uh, the armed forces in Bosnia, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and the main thing about uh, uh, Simon is, is that he is well and truly the awkward squad. Uh, we have him speak at a range of things that the Institute of Ideas organises, and you can absolutely guarantee he'll have a row with someone. So he's a fantastically important psychiatrist, but he also is prepared to argue and probe and ask difficult questions. So what a fantastic panel. Can we give them all, all a warm welcome? <laughs> Okay, Peter, give us your thoughts. My starting point is that free speech is one of the most important of all human rights. And that all throughout history, it has been under attack. Some of the most important people in human history have caused great offence in their time. And thank heavens, they did. I'm thinking of Galileo Galilei, Mary Wollstonecraft, Charles Darwin, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, and many, many others. They challenged the orthodoxy. And it was because we lived in societies where there was some degree of free speech that their ideas were able to be heard. Although, of course, going back into history, Galileo Galilei suffered terribly for his ideas about the universe. So that's my starting point. I do, however, think, unlike some people, that there are certain circumstances when free speech can be legitimately limited and should be limited. So, for example, if someone makes false damaging claims about another person, that they are a child sex abuser, a tax fraudster, a rapist, etc. That ought to be punished. Likewise, if their speech involves threats, menaces or harassment, that is an abuse of free speech. And particularly if they incite violence against other people. I think in those three circumstances, that is an attack upon free speech because when you go down that road, you actually limit the opportunity for open debate. So, for example, in Jamaica, when eight leading Jamaican pop stars 
put out records that openly encouraged the murder of LGBT people, LGBT campaigners could not engage in free speech and open debate because their lives were under threat. They had to go into hiding because those songs incited mobs <coughs> to attack their homes, their offices, and even try to kill them. So those are my circumstances where I think it is legitimate to restrict free speech. But otherwise, I think ideas, even offensive ones, ones that you and I may find disagreeable, we should challenge them in open debate. You know, if you censor or ban <coughs> ideas, they don't go away. The best way to defeat them is by open debate, subjecting them to scrutiny, providing the counter-evidence, the counter-arguments. And I know that there's been many, many occasions when I've debated against the advice of uh, others, uh, far-right Islamists, uh, far-right uh, white nationalists, um, all kinds of bigots, homophobes, misogynists, even racists. But I think I can say in my experience from the audience's response that they came off worse. When the spotlight of analysis and critique was shone upon them, their ideas were debunked and discredited. I just want to give you three examples where um, I think free speech has been um, challenged in very, very nasty, unpleasant ways from my own campaigning. Um, I mentioned the uh, Stop Murder Music campaign against the eight Jamaican reggae and dancehall singers who were inciting the murder of LGBT people. When the campaign group Outrage, the LGBT campaign group Outrage, um, working in concert with Jamaican LGBT campaigners, took up the campaign against these singers, we were denounced, even by many people on the left, as being racists and neocolonialists. We were seeking to defend black LGBT people in Jamaica and in this country against these incitements to murder, but there were sections of the left who denounced us as racists and neocolonialists. And I was banned from, or not invited or disinvited from speaking at lots of events because this left-wing currency determined that I was a racist for challenging these murderous incitements. When Ken Livingstone invited the Islamist extremist cleric Yusuf al Karadawi to London and hosted him at City Hall in 2004, again, myself and outrage were denounced by sections of the left as being anti-Muslim, as being racist, as pursuing a neo-colonialist imperialist agenda. This was a cleric who was saying that there was no debate about whether gay people should be killed, it's just the method that women who dress immodestly should be held responsible if they're sexually assaulted. That female genital mutilation was acceptable and advisable. And so on and so on and so on. My question is, what has happened when the left, which sprung out of the ideas of the Enlightenment and liberal values, is now suppressing those very same ideas, and resorting to smears and slurs to silence critics. The final point I make is that I've tried over the years to generate an open debate about the age of consent. What should the age of sexual consent be in this country? I'm talking about sexual relations between young people of similar ages. The age of 16 has been magic out of nowhere. There's no scientific, medical, or psychiatric evidence that 16 is the magic age at which young people become mature and able to consent to a sexual relationship. I've argued that young people who have a consenting sexual relationship with other young people of similar ages, even if one or two of them are below the age of 16, they should not be prosecuted, providing there's no more than two years difference in their ages, the kind of law that exists in Germany, Switzerland, and Israel. For saying that, I've been denounced variously by sections of the feminist movement, the left, child protection agencies, the far right, and the far left, as condoning, condoning paedophilia, condoning sexual abuse of kids. It just shows that when you try to have a rational debate, a calm rational debate about young people of similar ages, 
which is a perfectly legitimate thing in a democratic society, you can't have it. And I can tell you now, there are many child welfare professionals who privately also agree with what I'm saying, but they will not dare speak in public because they've seen what's happened to me and fear the same consequences. So that means we don't really have free speech when people are intimidated into silence. OK, great. Plenty of food for thought there and things to argue over afterwards, but thanks, Peter. Great. Um, Ed, your thoughts? Thank you, Claire. Um, Peter's just been able to say what he's been wanting to say and been applauded for it. So in the spirit of being a contrarian, I put it to you that you are not silenced. In fact, you're applauded for making an argument that lots of us find objectionable on moral grounds. But my point isn't to contradict Peter. My point is to say that um, a lot of Peter's work has contributed to a generation of people like myself moving away from the position that we've previously adopted in our lives. My first encounter was Pete, with Peter was in the 1990s when he was holding placards outside global caliphate conferences. And he was brave and uh, courageous in principle to do so, saying queers against mullahs. And uh, for someone who was born and raised in this country in the Muslim tradition, it was a big shock to have you know, both uh, those, those concepts plastered on a placard. But you know, over time, that sustained engagement in an open and free society led to many of us moving. And I think that the fact that the contrarian prize is pioneered by, and this event uh, uh, convened by someone like Ali Miraj, who's a Muslim, a British Muslim, I think is testament to the fact that contrarianness isn't at risk at, to the degree that we think it is, given the current political cycle. These things come and go. I speak as someone who, despite my rejection of Islamism, the political ideology, remains to this day a committed Muslim. And I cherish and um, want to see the West flourish for the, for, for, for the following two reasons. Firstly, the West is the outcome of a, a, a long tradition of contrarian thought. And in that, the, the prophets were pioneers, as were the philosophers. Just as Socrates was a pioneer in taking the poison and believing in the, the soul being elevated in the next life and defying the political order of the time and standing up to the charge that he was somehow corrupting the youth and those who followed in his footsteps subsequently, but also Cicero and his objections to the status quo at the time. Uh, Marcus Aurelius and the advice that he gave to uh, his own son and the political order in Rome at the time. Um, um, uh, Farabi, a, a prominent Muslim uh, maintainer, interpreter, commentator of Socrates and Platonic thought, it was a contrarian in his time. His great student, Ibn Rushd, his books were burnt um, in, in uh, quote unquote, Muslim Spain. But this, the influence that he had on Maimonides, the great Jewish thinker, philosopher, rabbi, all of those individuals were contrarian. Ghazali, his books today are cherished, but in, in his time, 12th century Persia, were burned. Now, the point I'm making is that there is this long tradition of, uh, of, of secular philosophy or religious philosophy or philosophers that gave birth to the Enlightenment and the modern West. They were also contrarians, and the contrarianness was cherished at that time as it is today. That list goes on to John Locke, to David Hume, to indeed Edmund Burke. And I think Burke is perhaps the most instructive thinker for us on, in terms of what you weigh up how you support freedom, <coughs> where you support contrarianness, and the consequences. And I think that's what's key in terms of consequences of, uh, of the actions of contrarians and where that leads to. Does it lead to uh, a greater degree of good for society on balance or a greater degree of harm? And what it means for the individual. And I think the three points that um, Peter rightly highlighted in terms of consequences are absolutely vital in, uh, in what we do and do not tolerate, uh, uh, cherish in the name of free speech. My other point is that the modern West is also the inheritor of another tradition. It wasn't just the philosophers and ancient Rome and the Enlightenment and Rousseau and the French Revolution and Karl Marx and where we, where we got to today. There was also the long tradition of prophets. And it, Abraham was a contrarian. Jacob was a contrarian. Joseph in Spain, in, in uh, Egypt, was a contrarian. Jesus in the Galilee and in, in, in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, was indeed a contrarian and killed for being so. Muhammad was a contrarian in his time for calling up for the one God in a pagan Mecca. And those two traditions today are at loggerheads. 
So it is reason versus religion, it is the philosophers versus the prophets or their subject or their respective inheritors that today find the Charlie Hebdo cartoons offensive. One group wants to bring them to the fore, the other group finds it offensive. So the, the, the children of Abraham, Muslims in particular, find the Charlie Hebdo cartoon depiction of the prophet in the Danish cartoons, uh, the, the, the desire to bring blasphemy laws back in Turkey and in Pakistan and calls for blasphemy laws here by Muslim organizations. <coughs> All of those are worrying symptoms displayed by the children of Abraham, the descendants of one tradition, the, the, the prophets. But my, my contention is the prophets and the philosophers are not at odds where there is conviction and confidence and where there is the Darashikor principle that Ali Miraj spoke about of pluralism, of openness and liberalism, we can marry the two. The West is an outcome of those two uh, traditions coming together. And the contrariness that both the philosophers and the prophets articulated in their time ought to be nourished for the very same reason that someone like me, and I'll conclude on this point, 200 years ago would not be welcome to be here. Muslims in the West are products of the fact that we live in a secular, free, liberal society, it is the ability to apostatize as well as to proselytize that allows us to uh, prosper here. Uh, 200 years ago, I would have been seen, seen as an apostate, as a heretic, as a blasphemer, a contrarian, and therefore not welcome by law to settle and propagate and proselytize and be who I am, observe my faith in public and in private. Now I can. The very underlying principles and philosophy and spirit that allows me and you know, 30 million Muslims to be here in the West, that same bridge must not be burnt in the name of trying to protect minorities and trying to protect Islam from Islamophobia and all the other claptrap that's gaining currency out there. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Ed. I, I, some, re some really interesting, <coughs> counterintuitive in some ways, ideas there that we'll come back to, but re really helpful for the discussion. Thank you. Giza. Thank you, Claire. Um, I want to sort of approach this from the politician's point of view, because where we are collective, where the contrarianists come in. And I was reminded of the importance of structures uh, when you <coughs> talked about Cyrus's cylinder. Uh, but it's only because the British Museum as an institution is not answerable to the government but to Parliament. The British Museum was able to loan the Cyrus Cylinder to the Iranians, uh, not only without having to ask permission of the government, but actually not telling them until 24 hours before they did it. <laughs> um, and uh, full marks to them. And he, we also mentioned Burke here before. And you see, this is, this is the extraordinary challenge. Uh, when I stand in Parliament, I'm actually not referred to as Gisela Stewart. I'm the Honourable Member for Birmingham Edgbaston. The fact that the Honourable Member for Birmingham Edgbaston had the nerve to stand in Neville Chamberlain's old seat, given that she was a German born near Munich and a socialist, uh, uh, is a historic accident, because quite frankly, if I had known that before I stood, I probably would have gone for a different constituency, because I thought it was somewhat presumptuous. But, but, but for us, the challenge is, uh, because is the nature of political parties and how you shape ideas and how you take them forward. The, just last week, I had someone from one of the IPU delegations, and we explained to them party management, the weekly web, political parties. And they said to me, they said, and what do you do when someone sort of persistently defies the whip? And I said, well, in the Labour Party, we make them leader at the moment. Mm. But, you know, <laughs> as to whether that is really the, the right way of going about it. Because, and this is where I think it, uh, uh, I, I want to talk about something which I think is, it, to me is enormously important. The, the will of the people undiluted as mob rule is actually a tyranny. Uh, the bureaucratic efficiency, uh, which a sort of nine-year-old uh, illustrated to me when he came to Parliament, and he said, Miss, why do you keep talking about things? Why don't you just make decisions? And I said, you're so right, it'd be so much easier, but you know, we've got something in the middle, which is uh, the democratic processes, which require uh, broad strands of ideas to sort of come together, and they form themselves into something that is deliverable. Uh, and there, therefore, you need the political parties. It's, it's a function, to my mind, of the large political parties to soak up the extremes, to kind of dilute them. But at the same time, I, as a Labour politician, I think it's also our, our job to keep pushing things that bit forward, to 
take the public with you where probably naturally they wouldn't go. And if, if I thought otherwise, I would become a Tory. Uh, but I actually believe that, that things ought to, you know, lumpy doozers, leopards, things have to change dramatically if you want them to stay the same. You know, you do require change. And that for us is, is, is a real challenge. And I always, I always compare it to you've got to be like a, a magnet and, and metal files. You, know? you can't be so far ahead of the public that, that you completely lose them. But you have to somehow take them with you. And that's when Burke, of course, comes in. Because uh, like now over the, the referendum, where we suddenly had uh, a, a direct mandate in a representative democracy, actually the institutions can't quite deal with this. So uh, when people now say, well, your constituency voted to remain, so therefore when Article 50 comes to the vote, you should vote against it, I'm sort of kind of with Burke. No, you send me there for my, A, you send me there for the judgment, plus I'm now implementing a national referendum. We, we, we played for one occasion to different kinds of rules. Um, but of course, the public always has this choice that every five years, if, if on balance they don't agree with me, they kick me out. Well, I think, and this is where politicians, to be a contrarian is a drug for politicians because we, we, we kid ourselves into thinking that it is us who they're, they're voting in our system. I reckon I'm worth about 6% and the rest goes with the party. That's about the margin of where you can make the difference. Now, do you think that's right or it's wrong? Well, you know, you, you make the decision. Um, so you can rattle the cage, you can challenge things, but if you're in the business of wanting to implement things, now it's quite different for Peter. If Peter wants to drive me to the point that I finally do what you want me to do, you can be as irritating and as outrageous and as persistent as you have to be until I get it and I start to respond. And then it is my job to take other people with me. And if I get enough people with me to, to, to arrive at that decision, then we've won. Uh, and like tonight, uh, I'm missing a vote on WASPI. Uh, now, if any of any women in the room between the, uh, were born between 1950 and 1955 will know what I'm talking about. For the rest of you, it will be completely meaningless. Uh, but it is something where women are being really, well, using a technical term, shafted over their pensions. Uh, and we know we keep fighting, and the government still doesn't get it, but we know we, we, we keep going. So I think the contrarian as a politician, first of all, it's my view in politics, as long as they're all nice to you, they're not getting anywhere. <laughs> Uh, so so the, the, the edginess, they're, they're kind of not just smiling at you, knows that they're starting to take you serious. But then our contrarian is not to be challenging everything. The real challenge for a contrarian politician is no one not to do something. Because you actually have to pick one or two big battles. And the reason, and I finish on that observation, I think the reason my politics at the moment is so destructive is because the big ideological ideas have gone. And the minute you move away from arguing over ideas, it becomes personal, it becomes unpleasant, and it becomes irrational. And then we've got a collective problem for democracy. Okay, uh, that was uh, really helpful and uh, insightful. Thank you very much. Um, Isabella, your thoughts? Um, thanks very much for having me. I thought I'd start off by explaining maybe who I am because I, I feel like an odd uh, addition to this panel. Um, I'm just a reporter for the FT. But I think maybe the reason I'm here is because I work for a blog called Alphaville and we uh, are a sort of odd entity within the FT in so much as we, we, we sort of operate uh, somewhat unilaterally and um, go around the edges so we're, we're not we're not part of the formal editorial process. And this has helped us over the years to really think outside the box and to look beyond the sort of consensus uh, established by the media because what happens is we, within the structure of, of, of any newsroom or uh, <clears throat> newspaper, why, whatever, journalists end up sort of covering beats. And this leads to a sort of groupthink within that beat structure. So Alphaville was very much created to get beyond that. And we joined the dots. And in so doing, very often, we end up looking far ahead of the curve than most other people, because it's the gray between the sort of established silos that sometimes gives you the greatest insight. 
So I, I thought I would start by explaining that, so maybe that's why I'm here. Um, but um, I also wanted to, I'm really, really excited about all, by all the ancient history references thus far. This is very good. <laughs> Cyrus. Uh, you know, so. um, <clears throat> but yes, I, I came to journalism and finance journalism for a very odd route. Um, I started off as an ancient historian, um, you know, bachelor's degree, then I did an MA, I did, also did in journalism, and then I, did, um, I also did an art foundation. Um, and, but the common thing I had between all those disciplines was that I was always fascinated in propaganda. Uh, so in, ancient, in my ancient studies, I would focus on the systems of Augustus and the cults he created. Um, and in my journalism degree, I did a sort of, um, my dissertation focused on the bias of um, anti-globalization protests and, and the media coverage of that. And even in my art, I tried to kind of look into the propaganda system. I was really, as a Pole, um, I came from a family that was very much um, aware of propaganda and always teaching me that you have to question everything because you can't trust anything. And um, I think that's why I ended up being a journalist. Um, and I oriented towards business news because business news is quite unique in so much as the markets don't care very much about political opinions. They, um, they're interested in prices. And prices, you can't find a clearing price unless you look across the whole spectrum of uh, different viewpoints. And this is, the, this is what Habermas, Jürgen Habermas, referred to as the public sphere. And it, it really originated from the coffee houses. And this was, this was you know, ended up being the, the, the stock exchanges of, of yesterday, but it also was the real sort of forum of pub, public debate. And um, early entrepreneurs would come here because they could really understand the whole broad range of perspectives. And it was seen as um, sort of not at all constructive to ignore the fringes, because if you ignored the fringes, very likely you were going to make a terrible, um, you know, investment. So... Um, so the FT has played a very special role here, I think, for me, because it really has allowed me to look be across the whole spectrum. Um, but what has happened recently has really quite terrified me, because I find myself, even at the FT, which I would say is one of the most open-minded um, papers out there, and without, I mean, perhaps now they're at they are seen to have a bias, but back in the day, I, I really did think it was it was both left, right, you know, whatever, anything goes. Um, but I do think there is pressure now in the in the media to conform to a certain sort of perspective, and it was this perspective that let us, you know, completely overlook the um, the forces that, that were sort of coming up in the rural regions, etc. And I think we still suffer from that sort of silo thinking. Um, there are three points, really, that I just want to make on that, is that there's been a lot of um, hoopla about this fake news phenomenon, and there has been a lot of um, discussion about whether or not we should be censoring um, the news flow we see in, in uh, platforms such as Facebook or, or, or even on Google. I feel very strongly that this is a terrible idea, um, because we have always, throughout the history of this demo democracy, entertained fringe uh, views. They have never gotten in the way of our democratic processes. Um, to start giving uh, platforms such as Facebook or Google the authority to make decisions about what you see and what you don't see is really very dangerous because they are not editorial institutions. They are not held to account. They do not have codes of conduct. They do not have a daily process of negotiation. And one thing that I think, the, the, you know, you referenced technology, and I think the really important thing we're missing in this technological revolution is the discourse that occurs in the process of delivering the news through a more established format. We have always had a daily news meeting. We have always debated the news that's fit to print. It isn't just a haphazard idea based on um, you know, the immediacy of news. Immediacy of news is actually quite tyrannical because there is no discussion. It is up to the... Um, you know, uh, it is completely subjective. It is, is determined by the um, reporter who is delivering that news. Um, and so I think sometimes we need to pause in the media, reflect, have those discussions, and then really provide a balanced um, assessment. And this is then what allows for pr a real debate, and it entertains both sides of, of the political debate. Um, and I think well, that's basically my point. <laughs> well, okay, thank you. Okay.
you know, we have to I'm share sorry, it. I didn't mean to. I, I cut you <laughs> off there or anything. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Simon, uh, yeah. that, was, that was great, by the way. And I loved your, I mean, Habermas and coffee houses. I'm over excited. But anyway, there you go. Um, Simon. You're excited very easily, Claire. <laughs> okay, so. so Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> so, it's generally true that no one would ever be, a, quote, against free speech. You never hear someone say, I'm against free speech. They usually say, I'm in favour of free speech, and then they say, but. And of course, there are limits, and Peter has extremely elegantly and persuasively, I think, argued for three areas in which there should be limits on free speech. I think it would be quite difficult to argue against that. But there's also a fourth one that is often mentioned, and that I want to talk about, and it's because I'm a psychiatrist, and it is uh, about the way we should limit freedom of speech because it might influence or harm mental health. And that's become a very increasing way in which particularly in the arenas that I work, we're here in, in, a, in a higher education institute, I work in another one down the road at King's, and we're increasingly hearing from students and many others about the need to protect their mental health by having warnings or some form of uh, way in which they can be w warned about possibly difficult material, upsetting material, offensive material, so they can decide whether or not they really want to expose them to that material. And the commonest argument that is put forward is that otherwise it would damage mental health. And just to cheer you up, we'll give you a classical illusion we had recently of a student um, who protested that um, in a classics course um, they were reading The Rape of Lucretia um, in the Livy version, and this was very upsetting. I mean, you, you know, obviously it wasn't going to be, you know, My Beautiful Pony, was it, with a title like that? You could have guessed. You might have been able to guess what the subject matter was, but she had not been warned about this. The tutor did not help very much by saying, well, you're not going to write like the rest of the course, then it's all about murder, rape, and says bestiality, etc., etc. And indeed, had the student been exposed to your favourite emperor, Diocletian, God only knows what he got up to with Christians, and it sounds like the consequences would have just been absolutely unbearable. Diocletian was very misunderstood. Was he really? All right. <laughs> Hard luck, clearly, clearly. I seem to remember he was a major torture and murder of Christians by, in, by the tens of thousands. But anyway, fortunately that one wasn't in the course material. But the argument was that this would be a risk to her mental health. And I get that a lot in my other job. You, Claire has just said that I'm the scratchers of the army and I'm often consulted, in fact, by media organisations who are putting out material, um, often dramatic material, on Bosnia or a recreation of Iraq, um, in which they're worried about the effect that this might have if those who've actually served there and been exposed to traumatic incidents were to see these very dramatic and, and, and extremely accurate recreations, they come to me and say, my God, what would happen? What can we do to lessen the impact? And all of that, I would suggest to you, is entirely wrong. And it's entirely wrong on mental health grounds. It's a complete misunderstanding of what actually mental health problems are and how they're created. Because the problem is that by encouraging avoidance of something that upsets you, it doesn't make you better, it makes you worse. Now, we all agree that being upset is itself not a mental health problem. And my particular profession has often been accused of pushing the boundaries of emotions too far, of professionalizing distress, of making shy people into socially phobic and slightly odd kids into Asperger's, et cetera, et cetera. That's not us, that's the Americans. They do that. <laughs> we don't do that. We don't do that. The Americans invent disorders every day, coffee drinking disorder, avoidant disorder, answering back to your parents disorder, obsessive love of guns syndrome. and thing. Actually, they, that's the one they haven't put in. The only thing that actually they should put in, they haven't put in. But we don't, we, we don't do that. We don't do that. We're very much against that. These are normal emotions, they're not pathological. But what if they were? What if being exposed to some traumatic material made people get more anxious, made them have a panic attack, etc., etc.? Would that be a terrible thing? And the answer is no, because what, what these are promoting is avoidance. Avoidance of change, avoidance of cues, avoidance of things that might distress you does not make you better, it makes you worse. The more you avoid, the more sensitized you become. The more you avoid triggers, the more likely you are to develop things like phobic disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, and so on. Because if that wasn't the case, that wouldn't be how we treat people. So when I treat veterans, and I do, who have had terrible incidents on deployment, I don't say, well, I'm going to talk to you, I'm a psychiatrist, but the only thing I'm never going to mention is the kid you shot by mistake in Iraq, because that will upset you. <coughs> That's not how we treat. We have to eventually do it. Now, we do it in a sensible way, but if we don't do that, people won't get better. 
and they will continue to have increasing more and more disability, more avoidance, less things they can do, their lives become progressively restricted, and their psychiatric disorders, what we're talking about, will get worse and worse. So what I'm saying then here is attempting to limit free speech is a crime. Um, you, or you may think it's a crime in all sorts of ways, censorship, whatever. I would say it's also, quote Talleyrand now, not just a crime, it's also a blunder. If you do so in the mistaken belief that by so doing you are protecting that other word, the vulnerable, that's another very modern word, from developing mental health problems. The truth is you're almost certainly doing exactly the opposite. Thanks. Thank you. Mm. Fantastic introductions, everyone. Um, so, so many uh, rich ideas there. Don't feel you have to agree. Um, I just say that I don't agree with um, Peter's three exceptions because I'm a free speech absolutist. Um, so feel free to argue, right, with each other and all the rest of it. We've had somebody saying, don't worry about fake news. <laughs> somebody saying, don't worry about trigger warnings. Um, um, the whole rich territory around... Um, uh, religion and secularism, which has become a massive uh, 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 kind of uh, problem in relation to the free speech wars, as it were, but nobody knows where they stand on anything. Um, whether you, um, as a politician, you know, are restrained by the very nature of the work that you do as well. I mean, you know, that, that it's all very well being Peter, you can go out, well, you can go and do that, but you know, <laughs> everyone else got to be, you know, what, what is it, what, where do all these, uh, these uh, uh, tensions lie? And also, do you agree? I mean, because a lot of people do not agree. People, people do say we live in more sensitive times. I mean, the response to me is to say we don't live in more conformist times. We live in more civilized times where you can't insult people and where you are sensitive to each other. And actually, this whole thing is a charade. If you think that, argue it. I mean, be a contrarian, at least in the context of this. So, hands up <laughs> if you want to speak, or say anything, or argue. Oh, good, that's good. Right, so there's a microphone doing the rounds. Uh, yes, there's, so we'll start with that lady there, and then we'll come down to the front, and then, yes, we've got a number. Uh, here's a question for Dr. Wesley. Do you draw a distinction between the showing of disturbing images towards a therapeutic result versus the... What, what, what is being called uh, the overshowing of disturbing images, pornographic images, the games, the violence, and whatnot, that then desensitizes. So uh, is there a distinction between oversensitiveness and desensitiveness? <laughs> OK, good, uh, good question. OK, so these two gentlemen here. My great bugbear is the denial from the political left, as well as the obvious suspects, namely the right-wing Islamists, but the denial by people that terrorists who say categorically, I'm doing this because of my religion and I expect to go to heaven, etc. People still try to deny that these people are motivated <coughs> by their religion because they're afraid that if they say that, they will upset Muslims in the street like me. And it's outrageous. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Um, I'm picking up on the fake news point that Isabella uh, raised there. And I, I'm potentially more of a comment than a question, but feel free to respond. Um, I wonder if there's an element of media hubrism involved in that, which, and looking back at the history of it, it really came to fruition, you know, to, to the public perception after the Trump election. It started out a bit after Brexit, where it started talking about that. But then it really came out there. Looking the days before Trump's election, the, the posts that were being posted around were about how every single major newspaper had endorsed Hillary, and there was one newspaper that had endorsed Trump. And then all of a sudden, um, we find that Trump gets elected. And is there an element of it, which is the, the media profession coming back and saying, we don't have the influence that we thought we had. Somebody else must have stolen it from us, as opposed to recognizing that potentially they're not as significant as they really think they are. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Um, so there's, uh, there's a gentleman here. Right, there's a gentleman here. Then I'll take that person at the back. Then I'll come back to the panel, and then I'll come back out again, yeah? Yeah, I just want to say to um, uh, the MP in Bravely... Speaking to the mic. Sorry. Who bravely back the Brexit campaign. You stated, I'll answer the question for you, but you stated <laughs> in, um, when you were speaking that uh, you didn't want the government to be too far ahead of the public. 
Yeah. <coughs> when there's the government ever in the head of the public, I'll, I'll answer that for you, never. Because I'll tell you what's going to happen when we leave Europe, right? Unless we go to Europe now and say to them, right, you see your BMWs and your Mercedes and all that, and your Renaults and your Peugeots and your Fiat's, we don't want them anymore. Right, we're going to get some half-baked deal where Europe still rules us, and the whole reason we voted uh, for Brexit, or the majority of people voted for Brexit, is because of the immigration into this country, and that's still going to happen. So unless we go for a hard Brexit and go to them now and say we're going to invoke that Article 50, that's what's going to happen. Okay, tension in the room. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly reasonable point, sir. I'm just making the point. I can see other people going, oh, oh. Right, on the back row. Uh, so I have a comment and a question on, on language. So Peter's uh, exceptions to free speech, as far as I could gather, were basically defamation or incitement, harassment, and violence. And it seems to me that the problem with some on the university campuses isn't that they disagree with this, but they've transformed the meaning of the word violence yep. so that they might say that merely speech they find offensive is violence. So Germaine Greer speaking at a university is violence to trans people. So I mean, you know, most reasonable people would say this is absurd, but how would you debate with someone who thinks violence is whatever offends them? And what is, what is your definition of violence, and does that have anything to do with, with their definition? I, I, I think that's a, a really interesting point, because the, um, the campaign to pull down, or to take down the statue of Cecil Rhodes, the imperialist in Oxford, was on the basis that walking past the statue was an act of violence to those students. And, you know, it wasn't, I mean, you know, you wouldn't make fun of that point in Oxford with the Rose Must Fall campaign because you would then be accused of racism because they would say, you don't know that that statue creates the violence of the imperialist, you know, and so on. So you, you make a very good point. Um, anyone wants to start? Right, Ed, Ed pick up anything. Um, you don't all have to speak, but pick up some of the things that you want to. Just two very um, quick responses to, uh, so the election, um, we've, managed to talk ourselves into the position that elections are somehow totally forecastable, that we must know what the outcome is before they happen, that the, <laughs> the whole point of an election is this unknown, that you're supposed to be deferring to the population to give you a result, and then you respect that result rather than somehow, it's the immediate gratification point, we must know what the result is, we can't possibly wait. And it, it's that culture that led to the New York Times and others, including the Wall Street <coughs> Journal, incidentally, supporting a candidate, hoping that they were, it's not just a being in touch point, I think it's just the expectation that we must know what's coming. And, and by the way, the, 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 the surveys and the polls must be right, because what people are telling us must be what they will end up doing in the ballot box. And I'm afraid that's just not reality. That's not the way people work. So we, in our political media elite class, we're operating in a, in a parallel universe that's disconnected from from, from, from the reality that is, you know, uh, quote unquote, the working man, the working woman, the working class. Uh, a quick example, I mean, if you look at Donald Trump's platform and if you contrast it with Hillary Clinton's platform, and it's interesting some of the conversations we've had here tonight, Hillary Clinton and the Democrats <coughs> talk more about LGBT rights and transgender rights and this whole transgender toilet obsession. Contrast that to uh, Donald Trump, who's talking about issues that matter for ordinary people, just in case it comes as a surprise to you, ordinary people still happen to be the majority. They're not part of the elite political academic media class. So when you talk about immigration, when you talk about uh, identity, when you talk about refugee crises, when you talk about economic shocks, that stuff resonates. You talk about that from the center ground, you win elections. You don't talk about that, you disconnect, you lose elections. It's not rocket science. Um, on the point of immigration, and I'll hand over to other panelists, I mean, it's no surprise that I'll defend immigration, and it's not because I'm a child of immigrants. I also think that immigration, on balance, is a, a boon for the Western world. The immig immigration is nothing new. It's been happening since the beginning of time. And I'm afraid to say, no matter how many more Brexit campaigns and Brexit referenda we undergo, there will be immigration to this country and immigrants from this country to other parts of the world. That's the way the world was built. Nation states are a relatively modern innovation. Read Peter Frankopan's book, The Silk Roads, multiple. And uh, I mean, ancient empires 
to uh, globalization today to we, we can we can have a debate about controlled immigration versus uncontrolled immigration i think we're onto something there yes and then the debate around integration assimilation and that and and, and and the freeze required to make that happen absolutely but to think that brexit was somehow about stopping immigration i'm afraid if that was the premise then it was a lie because it's not going to happen uh Gisela. Well, let, let me pick you up on this, because uh, I ended up, we, we, we created the organization Change Britain after the referendum for, for the reason that you, you, had a, you, you had a referendum which wasn't run along tribal lines, who could either take responsibility for the victory, either political parties, or you can console yourself for losing. So we were trying to bring Remainers and Leavers together to say, this is now how you implement it. And we're still running focus groups, and it's something very interesting about uh, immigration. Been doing quite a number of them up in the northeast and the northwest, and you we do them with groups of Remainers and with Leavers, and the Remainers say, "Oh, all the Leavers are racists," so they say, "Okay." So, what kind of immigration policy would you like? And the real objection to it is not immigration itself; it's the fact that you have different rules applying depending on geography rather than merit. And what people really don't think is right that you should have a huge chunk which has rights as as defined by geography. And, you know, my, my, my Indian news agent has to jump through hoops to get his mother into the wedding, uh, and, and they have to sit English tests, and they have to have a good character test. And it, 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 it's that what defines. But then you talk to them and you say, okay, but you know that's exactly the kind of immigration policy the leavers want. They say, oh, that's beside the point, they're still racist. Uh, what it was, what it it's got to be right. But, but yeah. there, there, there's the other thing which is happening at the moment in terms of free speech, which is a problem. One is the newspaper's algorithms they use for, the, you know, the FT and the Guardian, if you go into Google, uh, will always come to the top on their stories, not because the, t the stories are any better, it's because they're using lots of money to manipulate the algorithms of how the news come to the top. The second one is, uh, once you've got Twitter and email, I didn't do the Twitter bit, I just kept for, for a period of six weeks the abusive emails. And there literally were sort of about seven folders that high. And what was so extraordinary, so you know, there'd be the professor from Birmingham University who was sort of at 11.30 at night, and it was perfectly reasonable to send me this string of expletive deletives. When sort of 48 hours later I ran into him in, in the local Sainsbury's, he looked terribly sheepish when I said, oh, how nice to see you. Because we've got a mechanism of where the rant, which you'd be ashamed to put out, suddenly is out there. And that's where the politicians come in. We've got a real responsibility. And the gentleman's thing about the, the terrorism. If you kill people, I don't care why you kill them. It's wrong to kill them. Uh, if you, as a Sikh, think, come to me and say, I can't eat halal food. I want you to, to properly label halal. I, to, to you say, I'm not developing a special law for the Sikhs. I'm saying proper food labeling. Everybody should know what it is you're eating. We must not go down the road of, of taking a divisive issue and make it even more divisive. I think the task for me as a politician is then to say, how can I bridge this? And that's the toughest thing to do. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, you wanted to come in. Yeah, three quick points. Um, the whole issue about people's hypersensitivity uh, was brought to my mind recently when the University of Glasgow announced that students of archaeology would be able to absent themselves from classes on the grounds they might find images of skeletons offensive and traumatic. <laughs> You've made that up, Peter. No. I haven't made it no, up. No, really? No. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. <laughs> and you're not allowed to laugh because you're offending someone. <laughs> right, carry on. Good God. On the issue of violence. <laughs> On the issue of violence, we know what the English language definition of violence is. It's about a physical assault and harm. Um, the attempt to now transform that or expand that into mental <coughs> or emotional harm it goes against all the principles and values and definitions that we have traditionally understood. And it blurs the lines in a way which I think is deeply insulting to real victims of actual physical violence. So for people who have been subjected to sexual, racial, or homophobic violence, 
to equate, you know, offensive words and language with what they've been through is profoundly and deeply insulting. Um, and of course, I always tell these people, you know, you go to Iran and hear the stories of what happens to the Kurds, the Baluch, the uh, Arabs in Iran. They know real physical violence. It isn't just about bad words, about racist language. It's about actual execution of people on trumped up charges. And so we need to keep that in proportion. Mm -hmm. The final point I'd say is that the, the idea that uh, somehow um, we can wish away the idea that Islamist extremism is motivated by an interpretation of Islam is absurd. Um, President Obama, as on a number of occasions in response to terrorist outrage, to saying, this has nothing to do with Islam. Well, that's like saying the Crusades had nothing to do with Christianity. Um, uh, thank you, Peter. Isabella? Um, <clears throat> I'd like to just um, make a point uh, on the language distortion and your <coughs> fake news point. Um, so language distortion fascinates me because it's, you know, it, it complements my fascination in propaganda. And I think this is one of the main problems that we're facing is that words are just not, they don't mean what they are supposed to mean. We have um, created a sort of propaganda network and it's not just the political um, sort of for uh, forums and initiatives and movements that are doing this. It's very much the corporate movements and um, the whole um, algorithmic problem is, is a real problem. And I, I would uh, diagnose the problem as one of uh, you get what you pay for. So we've created, we've normalized an environment where news is free. Now, if news is free, it's propaganda. And there will be twisting of words. There will be a sort of um, deviation of that of, of their meaning. Um, for example, innovation is one of my um, favorite words to analyze because innovation is now only positively um, sort of utilized. But in reality, innovation can be both negative and positive. Criminals are amongst the most innovative people on the planet. <laughs> but you never hear that side of the word anymore. Um, and so the word is not just distorted, there's a debasement, as you were referring to the spectrum of like the, the word violence. You know, what is when, when, you, when you see real violence, if you can't use that word, you need to invent a whole new word, or like hyper-violence, I don't know. Um, so the other point is on the fake news. I totally agree with, it was, yeah, it, I totally agree with you. I think um, it's, it shocks me that it took a political outcome to acknowledge that this was a problem, because the reality is we've been, consuming completely biased news for years now. Um, and it's because of the freemium problem more than anything. Um, it's not to do with, with the algorithms per se. It's the fact that if you don't pay for your news, you're not going to get neutral news. And we have normalized a, a propagation system, which is not only very tunnel visioned, but it is focused on magnifying the feedback loop and giving you what you want because that's what advertisers um, get value out of. Now I think it's very sad that it took a political outcome to make us realize that we've been in this sort of hyper normalized state where we think this is all normal. Okay thanks Simon anything you want to pick up? Yeah sure I'm, I'm just slightly amused looking along the panel I think five of the six of us are immigrants or the children of immigrants the only one who isn't is you Claire and you're from oh, well, Liverpool. That, you're from that's Liverpool. You don't know about you? my parents. Oh, really? go, we'll let you no. I thought you were from Liverpool. Much the same thing. My, my parents are like, <laughs> inevitably, the Irish, you didn't go further than when okay. they got off the boat. Much, okay. but anyway. <laughs> yeah. I thought so. Anyway, but to answer your question, it's a very, very good question on oversensitization and, de and desensitization. It's quite interesting when you do go out with the military to where they go and do their work. Um, what do they do when they're not on duty in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, what they do is just two things. They watch pornography and they play incredibly violent video games, almost constantly, literally almost constantly. And, and they're completely open about it. It's not in any way hidden and, um, and it's extremely obvious. And in fact, if you're a bit like me, um, you find it slightly disturbing, but they don't. Does it make any difference to how they react? No, it doesn't. When they get bereaved by uh, someone, a friend being killed, or when they've done something that violates their own professional <coughs> rules of conduct, like shooting a child by mistake, etc., they get the same mental health problems that you would expect. So it doesn't make any difference at all. And indeed, programs of trying to desensitize or de, de inoculize um, people, including some of those as well, have always failed. So I don't think these are the same things, but it's a very, very good question. Thanks for asking. Uh, thank you. Okay, so let's take some more questions then, or points. So that gentleman there, please. 
and, and, and oh yes, right, no, there's a man next to you in the back row. Afterwards, next, yeah. And then, then. I'm slightly confused about a few points, but I'll just take one or two where I can. Yeah, um, so I, I, can we make sure the mic, yeah. Why, why do we believe that American election did not pan out or the pollsters were wrong? Because what we do know about American election today is that Hillary Clinton won popular vote by a humongous margin. There is no question about that. We also know that in Wisconsin, people who came out and gave pollsters the exit poll that said that we voted for Hillary, quite a lot of those votes were discarded. So things that are happening in American election as we see right now does not say that the pollsters were wrong or uh, newspapers who gave backing to Hillary Clinton were wrong or we cannot assume the outcome of an election. We cannot assume. I will agree with that. But all the indicators were correct except for one. Nobody realized that some polls will be manipulated, some votes will be manipulated. Those things were not done. So I do not know why we are not paying attention. One of the problems at the moment with both Brexit and the American election is about this saying that there were some forgotten people. Again, large number of people to whom LGBT was an issue and Hillary Clinton was answering, then they voted for her. So why are we not <coughs> looking at that and addressing those things and say that the man who presumably is elected the president, he may not be elected president for a few days. We do not know. We're hoping that he will not be. But we have to consider all these things before we say that the pollsters were wrong, newspapers were wrong, people did not say the truth, and so on and so forth. Okay, okay. Um, I won't argue back, but yes, yes. Um, <laughs> no, but people would, might want to comment on that. But anyway, that gentleman there. Then. A couple of quick points. Um, one is I think we need to just recognize that these big decisions that have been taken in Brexit and America recently, there is a, a wide diversity of reasons un underlying them. Um, and to be frank, I'm getting a little fed up of being told why I voted for Brexit, <laughs> um, which are reasons I, I didn't. <laughs> um, secondly, um, I'm attracted by Peter's um, limits on, 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 on free speech. Um, wonder if you could just expand a little on, on, on the harassment um, side of it. I'm, I'm, I'm still turning these things over in my mind, and I'm just wondering whether there need to be limits to the time and place that we're free to say things, or is it the intensity with which they're said? Um, what do you see as the, as the limits in, in, in that sort of area of speech rather than incitement to, uh, to violence or... Uh, or uh, um, defamation. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yes. It's a, it's a question for primarily, I suppose, for something Isabella said earlier, which is that people realise, something I just don't understand now at the end of the year, people realised after the Brexit vote, particularly journalists, that they were somewhat disconnected and they were very surprised, many people were surprised by what had happened and maybe they needed to re-engage with you know, and some people did go out, talk to people outside of London and whatever. But looking back now in November, the, those same journalists and other people as well seem to have become even more disconnected and even more shocked by either the repercussions of what happened in June or by what's happened in America. Whatever your views are on it, it's like it's complete alarm. And it's either a conspiracy, those people were wrong, they were duped, and it's not even considered that Maybe the majority of people who voted had a different opinion. Maybe a majority of people voted for Trump because they wanted to, whether you like it or not. It's not that difficult, really, to realize that is the case. And the thing I don't understand in terms of conformism and contrarianism, certainly there seems to be a huge amount of conformism amongst certain classes or certain groups it, through this year and an inability to self-reflect and maybe sort of break out of that mold. And I don't know if something you could possibly comment on. Okay, thank you. Sorry, this gentleman here, just because I promised him, right. You next, no, no, in the front there. 
In the front. Then it's that gentleman over there, and then there. Yes. Uh, I think uh, my question to the, to the panel is about more in a practical sense as to how somebody can be contrary practically, because someone can be independent, somebody can be courageous in their views, but sacrifice questions me, because everybody has got a family. How can you openly say, I mean, just your personal views, because you know, we all got families, children, and all of those kinds of stuff. How, what is the process that someone has to go through to be a contrarian from a <laughs> practical perspective? Because we all got jobs, we all got mortgage to pay. Not everybody can be in that stage of either affordability or family connections to say that I'm openly contrarian. So I just would like some ideas or what you have done. Thank you. I think that's a very important point, by the way. Because, I, mean, I don't know that this is an event where we're saying you've all got to leave the room and be contrary. Yeah. But, but, there's, but there's something more, because it relates to some of the other points, which is one of the things that I don't like at the moment is what is known as call-out like call culture, mm. which is, is that you say that we've heard a little bit of the reference to it. You, you, know, you, 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 vote, you vote in good faith for whoever, and you get accused of either racism or white supremacism, or you say something, you want to explore possibly whether you have transgender bathrooms or not, and immediately you're transphobic for even saying, I just, 25 gender choices presented to children in Brighton schools, I'm not convinced. And people will say, how dare you, you want to, you know, kill people who are transgender. It's like, no, I wasn't saying that. But why that relates to that is because if you actually professionally get called out as a racist, um, this can have serious consequences. If you're mm. accused of homophobia, Islamophobia, any of these mm. things in certain jobs, I mean, you know, you're kind of looking over your shoulder. And I think that, that, that atmosphere is the one which I would want to challenge. But I'm appreciative of the fact that, you know, it's fine for the director of the Institute of Ideas, it, you know, yeah, I could get away with it, and not that I want those things being said to me, but I also um, uh, think that's the problem that this prize seeks to confront, which is to draw attention to the fact that you can't speak freely or openly or in good faith with each other if we're going to be accused or labelled in this way. Um, so that's just, just to make the, the point. So, sorry, yes. Um, it's that gentleman over there that we're going to, but Simon, you just wanted to... Well, just to answer the question, the best way to do what you've just said is not to have children, uh, because, <laughs> uh, because I have, uh, all the time, I have the children who constantly tell me, you can't say that, Dad. We hear that, you know, five times a day from them. So the best way to be that is make sure you don't have any children, because they're actually far more conservative than, than, uh, than our generations. Uh, uh, mm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes. Mm. <laughs> I'd like to address the role of the media. Um, I used to work for a, a very large international news agency, not CNBC, another one, and uh, the sub-editors spiked 95% of the stories that came in. The 5% that remained were entirely rewritten. Now I have another capacity as editing a number of magazines. And I have a similar problem, but seen from the other side, which is that I have to self-censor, or I, my subconscious self-censors self what I actually put out or approve as editor on the basis that it may or may not, uh, that I imagine my readership and I have to imagine what is acceptable to them or not. How can you help me? Okay. Um, right. Any any uh, last uh, you know kind of comments or, or kind of uh, things you'd like to say? So we've got two people down here. Oh yes, there's that gentleman there. Let me take the the man there just because the microphone's next to you, and that, and then that gentleman there. Uh, thank you. The thing that I didn't think came over. It was a really wonderful event. Thank you for putting it on. But nobody really talked about the difference between playing the player which is the objectionable bit, and playing the idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because conformity oh, see. seems to go for the player, and that is the damage that is done. Otherwise, it'll be fine. OK, that's a very, very useful contribution, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, Peter, this is for you. Um, I imagine from a principled position, you believe in freedom of speech, or people do, precisely for the views they don't hold. Um, 
everyone believes in freedom of speech if people agree with them. Um, so, um, you suggest there should be some limits on freedom of speech, um, which I think in a way is a contradiction in terms, um, or at best a qualified definition that empties the concept of its meaning, because it's no longer free. Um, so the question is, how can you explain the position that in some cases, impoverished, dangerous, stupid ideas will be undermined or dismantled in rational debate, but in other cases, certain ideas won't? Because then there's a presupposition of what humans are. Um, so that's the question. That's uh, very interesting. I must talk to you about that afterwards, because that's very good. Um, <laughs> One of the things that maybe the panel could address when they're about to do their summation, but as well, uh, if they've got a chance, but just maybe think about is increasingly now, it's not just what you can discuss, but who's given permission to talk about it as well. Mm. That's part of the identity politics thing, which is that not only are you not allowed to look at certain subjects, but it's, you know, as a woman, I find that offensive. As a Muslim, I find that offensive. As a, a, a person of colour, I find that offensive. And then if you kind of contradict it, it's right. Like, you've got no right to say that because you're a man and you can't therefore have any opinion on anything to do with uh, women's liberation or man, abortion or, or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, mansplaining. Why, I mean, I've been accused of white-splaining so often recently. Uh, um, uh, you know, that's become the new thing, right? So... Um, Yes, so there's that side to it. But the other thing is the incitement, and I think this is maybe where I, Peter and I might disagree, but it's also incitement to violence. I mean, not only do we not know what violence is, but the incitement presupposes that you kind of read something and do it. And I think we get into all sorts of difficulties. It's one of the things that is quite tricky, which is surely you have the responsibility as the person who reads it, rather than, the, the, rather than banning the idea, it's you as the person who reads it. I can read all sorts of things. It doesn't mean I kind of then go, oh, yes, I've read that, now I must go off and do. So it's where responsibility for ideas lie and so on. Um, and one, one on the fake news thing I thought that was funny, and this is how it kind of prejudiced, was The Guardian has just been done over um, by somebody uh, in a rather amusing story, which is they printed an anonymous, uh, uh, impassioned view of somebody who said that they were... Uh, radicalised um, uh, by the alt-right because they looked at <coughs> Milo Yiannopoulos' uh, videos and that had made them uh, turn into um, Muslim-hating uh, xenophobes. Um, and they kind of printed this and they said, that's why I think that we've got to be very careful of these you know, pernicious ideas being allowed to spread and we've got to, you know, and they kind of printed this. I mean, honestly, I can't tell you, it's a caricature of itself, this article. Why their antenna, antenna didn't go off and they think we've been set up here by somebody who's kind of making fun of them, which indeed they were. And uh, especially in the week that it happened, it was when Milo Yiannopoulos has been banned from a school in Kent um, using the prevent policy, um, even though the pupils at that school, the teachers at the school, the head teacher and the parents all wanted him to speak so that the pupils could scrutinise uh, his views. Uh, the, he's a guy who likes Trump, by the way, if you don't know who he is. Um, but anyway, and, and, and kind of like then this was the prevent scheme uh, being used was suddenly backed by 50 academics who hate the prevent scheme because it was against the right, right? But somehow the Guardian missed all this, printed it, and didn't notice they were being stung. But the point that was was that it was making fun of this idea that you would watch something and then do it. So incitement, free speech, and all that, I think, is, is worth bearing in mind. Um, OK, last comments on the floor. That was to give you last chance. Then you're on a warning panel. Give us your last thought in a minute. So there's this lady here. Um, it, O over there and there. I suppose one of the things that I'm concerned about is where does truth lie in this, particularly on the news issues, that everyone has the right to publish what they want. They don't have to, uh, it doesn't have to be based on truth. And I think that's a bit of a worry. And in all of the kind of conversations, there, you know, there are some truths which somehow seem to get lost in you know, my right to debate and my right to say anything I like. OK, great question. Right, uh, yes, sir. Yes, uh, that, I was wondering that, yes. if the panel could help me. Um, is Donald Trump a true contrarian, or is he just masquerading as one? Very good question. Very good question. That person there, fast now. Yeah. Um, as contrarians, um, I wonder if we accept that um, the, 
the, an idea of having an age of conformity involves a kind of cultural power, but that's also the, a kind of the cultural power is often the thing that people uh, who try and protect uh, and, and uh, negate the speech of others um, say use. It's a kind of that's the root cause often of the harm that is cited. That there is a power in speech or a power in the cultures or a power in being white or privileged or whatever. Um, so. Uh, you know, you know is, ha, when people influence and interact with, with one another, is it possible to say that there can be an age of conformity? Do cultures have power in the way that we can talk about it here? Or is there a kind of, do we have to reject the whole idea of an age of conformity in order to, def to, to defend contrarianism? Okay, thank you. Um, and the, yeah, so I, I, I'm, there's that gentleman there. Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yes, yeah, sir. I actually think it's... It's a bit ironic, maybe, that this could be an echo chamber tonight, because Bill is a contrarian prize debate, but I think most people who are willing to come to a room like this must be in some way open-minded to start with, so I think we're preaching to a it. I'm mm. really optimistic about it all, because I think as the world becomes smaller, people physically travel and virtually travel, they will meet people from different perspectives and places, and eventually it will sort itself out. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, but just not to be an echo chamber, you couldn't be further from the truth, and that is completely wrong. <laughs> it's never been worse. Um, but anyway, um, yes, sir. Uh, I'm just interested how the panel reconcile um, a unlimited acceptance of contrarianism and freedom of speech with the idea of setting a bar for extremism, uh, and particularly uh, how the government should then be able to talk about extremism and where they should set the bar. Or okay, there's no chance, panel, that you can answer hardly any of those questions. Um, so you, no, formally, formally, because you haven't got long. So take your kind of a question and something you, you want as your last thought. Uh, I, I'll take people, I, I'm sorry to say, in reverse order, so someone get ready. And oh, just kind right. of a punchy last thought and, and something you want to answer uh, kind of in a minute each. Um, just to tell you because then we'll clap at the end of all that, that after this there's a reception and so there's also an opportunity to chat informally, <coughs> argue with each other and, and talk to the panellists of course and that's until nine o'clock and also, it's slightly embarrassing, I will be signing my book if you want to buy it. No. I did not organise that, Ali organised that, I don't like announcing it. However, it is a bloody good book and it answers a lot of these, <laughs> it answers a lot of these questions. So there you go. And you can read it, get offended, and then come and argue with me. So that's good. Um, OK, so uh, Simon, give us your last thought, please. Well, I won't be signing my book. It's called The Randomised Controlled Trial in Clinical Psychiatry, which is sold 18, <laughs> <laughs> sold 18 <laughs> copies so far, three of them for me. Um, so I, I mean, I hope, I hope you know, on the one hand, I have hopefully tried to convince you that uh, trying to protect mental health <coughs> restricting uh, exposure to difficult, challenging, and offensive ideas or images or whatever is um, doomed to failure and indeed is the wrong strategy if we are interested in protecting uh, mental health, as in indeed we are. But uh, one thing that wasn't picked up, which is a difficult one that someone from the audience mentioned, was the role of harassment and bullying. I think it was a gentleman over there mentioned, and none of us picked that up, and Peter, you didn't either. But that is of great concern because we do know that the mental health consequences of harassment and bullying in children are very profound. And the kind of longitudinal studies that we've done show that this has a really serious effect on child development and dramatically increases the risk of depression and other disorders in later life. And I think we skipped over that. And I think because it does raise some issues that are difficult to answer as to what, what point um, do we step in and, and say, you know, harassment of a verbal type, or what most is, um, actually does have a big impact on mental health. But I don't think um, it's what we came in to talk about. But it raises questions that are actually quite perplexing, and I'm not quite sure where we should be on some of those other issues. It isn't that simple. Uh, thanks, Simon. Uh, Isabella? Buy my book. <laughs> yeah, the answer to your question on bullying is actually in my book. No, Seriously, there's a whole big section on it. Oh, so anyway, there you go. Book. Right, anyway. <laughs> Isabella? Like both book, books. Um, so I'll, I'll um, address the me media questions. So the first one was about whether or not we are still refusing to acknowledge that we are living in a bubble and, and not listening to the wider population. And I would, I would, I would say yes. I think uh, my colleagues have really disappointed me. And I am 
like I've never felt so alienated and I'm self-censoring all the time and I can't find um, you know I'm, I'm genuinely quite scared to express my opinions um, and uh, on Twitter I think it's it's a jungle anyway but it's there's a good example of um, address sorry I'm, I'm wittering because I'm a little bit tired but to your point about what is truth does truth matter and I would say that there's been this sort of really scary reaction where, we're, where we've developed a sort of fact police um, where we're fact checking everything blah 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 but of course this is this is a fallacy because facts um, can also be used to distort um, and manipulate and I can frame a story using absolute 100% facts um, all through it and still be um, misleading you so just because the facts are true doesn't necessarily mean the story is accurate and truth is subjective and as a historian I can tell you that it really depends on the perspective of the person recounting the story but I also think what's happening is that in this sort of neoliberal um, uh, I guess environment that we've created we sit in a lot of grey and a, a lot of ideas are contradictory and it's very hard to find people who have the sort of capacity to hold conflicting thoughts at the same time so it's not only natural that people will move to the extremes if the narratives make more sense and I think in journalism we are now um, you know being put off this idea that narratives matter or that stories matter whereas I would argue that actually you have to create an environment where competing stories um, work against each other and that's how you build some sort of idea of what consensus is. Um, and my last point really is uh, there was a chap who mentioned the limits of, uh, of sort of access on Twitter and things like this. When, 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 is, when is there too much sort of harassment? And as someone who has been harassed quite a lot by Bitcoin people, of all people, um, <laughs> I, um, I think... <laughs> I think um, I think it's true. I think what we you know this is still a new technology and there is no etiquette. And I, f I find that sometimes the most obstinate people on Twitter are people who don't necessarily understand that they're really intruding into your personal life. And you wouldn't do that in in reality. Um, we haven't really developed a kind of code of code of conduct or an et like a you know like back in the old days when you had etiquette. And I think we need to develop something like that. And um, in terms of the limits, you know, let's remember that our democracy is founded on a, on a core principle which is innocent until proven guilty. And um, in this sort of uh, labeling and um, you know, in environment where we're just accusing people of being racist just because they've said this or that, this is a really scary environment because you can't prove a negative. It's very hard to prove a negative. And we've created like a judicial process which allows people to be um, you know, deemed innocent until proven guilty for that very reason. OK, thank you very much, Geetha. Actions have consequences, I think, is really the, 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 the key thing when you talk about whether you limit free speech. Uh, in, in, in my job, I want to persuade people and have them come with me. So the, the, the language I choose, the way you present it, uh, is one thing. If you're a demagogue, uh, whether that is Geert Wilders or in some, <coughs> even, you know, the way Trump was doing his campaign, then you're going to be as outrageous as possible. And your only limit is you don't want the outrage to turn into disgust because when you turn into disgust, you lose them. Mm -hmm. So th these, these are mechanisms of you know, outrage, contrariness. But the, the really interesting thing which I found was, was, was your question, because I found doing the referendum campaign, when, when you get to the point when, when, when Twitter is so vile, uh, but you still need to know because of the death threat, you do have to actually tell the police about it. Uh, so yeah. I kind of didn't look at it ask someone else to say, could you help me for a period? Don't respond to it, because actually, the gutter doesn't respect you for joining them in the gutter. <laughs> uh, but the thing which I found personally hardest was to, to, to strike the balance between that I felt I needed to still be upset about all this rubbish. Uh, uh, but I didn't want to become so hard that it just bounced off me, because if I did, I would become the kind of person I don't want to be. And I think that, personally, is the hardest. And you find a question on children. My children had to close down their entire Facebook and things because they got masses of saying, your mum has just ruined my entire life, future, and everything, you know? And my kids just did absolutely the right thing. They just shut everything down for a week until everybody calmed down. Um, thank you, Gisela. Um, OK. Oh, Ed, yeah. So, Gisela's points are interesting. But I, mean, I uh, several points. Firstly, on, on Brexit. My starting point was to support Brexit. Um, 
and then I voted against Brexit. I was a reluctant Remainer. <coughs> The, the strongest argument for me for Brexit is that we have our parliamentary democracy back and we have a degree of sovereignty in our own country and not being controlled by Brussels. But some of the arguments that I'm hearing around immigration and that somehow the Indian shopkeeper should be able to bring his relatives over more easily than the Bulgarian or the Polish person, I find that difficult to accept because somehow I'm being told, and the rest of the country is being told, that the white, Polish, Christian Catholics are not acceptable, but the Muslim from... No, 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 from I said Muslim geography. From, I said Muslim geography. From, I was yeah, very yeah, careful. By extension, the Muslim from Nigeria, the Muslim from Pakistan, Commonwealth ties, are, is somehow more acceptable. And that's just hard to see going down the road. But all that said, you know, Brexit has happened and we must re respect the democratic process. And that's what brings me to the point that the gentleman raised about Trump. The expectation on the, on, on the side of readers is that newspapers... Uh, if they're going to predict, they predict the right outcome based on the rule of law, just as we accept the outcome of the Brexit referendum and, you know, to quote Theresa May, May we're all Brexiteers now, but, but we expect the newspapers to get it right based on the electoral college, not based on the popular vote. So you get it right within the, within the framework, within the rule of law. Abandon the rule of law, who are we? And for America and for American pol political leaders, now is the second election, Al Gore and Bush had a similar fight out. Now this, this has reached a whole new stage of ugliness to be fighting over who actually votes sends exactly the wrong message in a world full of uncertainties and dictatorship when we look on to America as the greatest and largest, not the largest, but the greatest democracy in the world, uh, to be providing a degree of moral leadership rather than compromising ourselves on the basis of, on, on the rule of law. Now a couple of other points on um, very, very, very quickly. Uh, th this, uh, you know, interesting hearing Gisela say that you know, if someone claims something Sikh and halal and she's got to find a balance for it and I think this is part of the problem